Good afternoon, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, dear Professor Godley. Welcome here in our auditorium for a very festive moment, I can say. Before I give you the floor, I would like to address some words to you as a matter of welcome at our university. And it is with great pleasure that I take this moment to reflect on this new endowed chair and more specifically, the woman who will occupy it for the next five years. The woman who, was, who has been the editor-in-chief of the BMG since 2005 and who in my eyes has expanded the job description of editor-in-chief in a very special way. With Fiona Gottlieb, the English expression showing the courage of your convictions fits perfectly. She exhibits a lot of bravery when pursuing the issues that she knows are important to medicine and health, often in the face of reluctance, skepticism, and sometimes even outright opposition. For example, she demonstrated leadership in uncovering the scientific fraud behind Andrew Wakefield's false claims of a link between autism and the MMR vaccine and during the BMG's campaigning for the release of the raw data on the safety of statins. With the heart of a doctor, the head of a journalist, and a sense of fun, you address these issues, genuinely driven by the mission to make the world a healthier and more open place, and recognizing also that you can lead and make a difference. In addition, I was told, I have some spies in the, uh, in the university and outside, I must say, you have a great talent for teaching, which our colleagues at the Care Research School have been able to experience several times, such as at the master classes in primary care research leadership training at Oxford. And within care, there is still talk of the successful master class that you gave last year to junior and senior researchers during the care days, followed by an inspiring plenary keynote lecture. Now, of course, scientific research must meet certain quality standards to be eligible for publication in a good journal. But writing and presenting that research well is also crucial for the impact of a publication. In your view, there is no need to have to choose between exciting writing and scientific writing, something that also benefits interdisciplinary cooperation. You teach people how they can write an abstract so the reader can easily judge whether it's worth spending another hour to read the whole article. But also that you shouldn't uncritically declare every scientific publication an irrefutable truth. In a very interactive way, you know how to bring researchers a step further in their development in this area. Thanks to your enormous amount of experience, you give researchers an insight into the backside of the embroidery work, it's a nice phrase, I think, that a scientific publication sometimes also is, but without bias, quite the contrary. With great enthusiasm, you remain open to new insights and experiences from others. I've also been told that scientific integrity is high on your agenda and you're a leader when it comes to open access publishing, as well as the promotion of new forms of publication. You're also responsible for connecting medical domains from basic biomedical science to public health. This interdisciplinarity is also a priority in Maastricht. We're therefore especially pleased that as a professor and coordinator, you will be strengthening the connections within the Netherlands School for Pri Primary Care Research, the partnership between the Radboud Institute for Health Sciences in Nijmegen, the Institute for Health and Care Research in Amsterdam, Amsterdam the Netherlands Institute for Health Services Research in Utrecht, and our own Care and Public Health Research Institute. We eagerly look forward to the transfer of knowledge to a new generation of researchers that will be the focus of your chair. And I have already understood from your colleagues here that the enthusiasm is mutual. You also told me just when we were in the, in the other room. But did you already know that Maastricht is home to one of the most beautiful hiking, cycling, 
and even water sports environments in the Netherlands. I admit it's not as wild and unlikely a place as the Bay of Bengal, where I heard you dashed with your India editor between meetings in Kolkata, leaving a surprised local crowd behind. But in our mass plassen, you can also take some very nice trips. Dear Fiona, I wish you a lot of success and especially inspiration during the coming years in this chair at CARE. You are someone who really cares about research collaboration, as well as the support and coaching of promising young researchers in the field of public health and primary care. And I think I speak on behalf of the entire university, definitely of the executive board and the faculty board, that we couldn't think of any more suitable candidate than you. So congratulations. And I now give you the floor to give your inaugural address. Thank you, Professor Lecture, for those very kind words. I'm extremely honoured to be the first CARE professor, and I wanted to give special thanks to the directors and governors of CARE, Professor Onno van Schaik, Chris van Veil, André Knotneros, Peter Groenewegen, and Guy Windershoven. My Dutch is in, in development, as you can see. Um, after Brexit, those of us who wanted to remain in Europe have been looking for every possible way to retain our links with Europe. Uh, my husband and children are applying for their Irish passports at, as we speak, uh, but I don't have the eligibility for an Irish passport, but instead I have this new special and highly valued connection with the Netherlands, and I'm very grateful. I want to also acknowledge the huge contr contribution of my colleagues at the BMJ in the work that I will discuss and my mentors over the years at the BMJ and at other journals and institutions. So, here is what I have to say in a nutshell. It is that the principles of evidence-based medicine are sound, and like democracy, there is no real sensible alternative to applying evidence in practice. But the evidence itself is deeply problematic, and these problems are seriously damaging health. So, now we can all go home. That's what I, that's what I have to say. Uh, but first, I thought, uh, since you are, have given me this great honour, I would like to um, tell you a bit about my journey so that you understand where I am coming from. It's a journey from medical romanticism to evidence scepticism. And I hope, that in despite, I hope that despite what I will say about the current situation, you will, like me, retain your optimism for the future. So, this is me. I'm at the bottom. <laughs> I'm here with two of my siblings. Uh, we also have an older brother who's not in the picture, and our mother is behind the camera. All four of us children became doctors. Perhaps that's not a surprise. Our father was a doctor, a radiotherapist in London, and he himself came from a medical family. His great uncle was Sir Rickman Godley, the first surgeon to remove a brain tumour, who later became president of the Royal College of Surgeons and surgeon to the king. His uncle was Joseph Lister, father of antisepsis. And his father was Joseph Jackson Lister, my great-great-great-grandfather. He was a Quaker, a London wine merchant, who invented the bichromatic microscope, which allowed the examination of tiny particles and therefore gave the beginning of microscopy and microbiology. So I grew up with the idea that doctors are good people who apply science to better understand and improve the human condition. You could say I had no choice but to become a doctor. And yet it didn't feel like that. It was what I always wanted to be. So I qualified in 1985. It was during the new era of large randomized control trials. And at the hospital I worked at in London, they were recruiting patients to ISIS too. In those days, ISIS meant something very different. A randomized trial comparing aspirin streptokinase, both or neither, in people with suspected myocardial infarction. And it was my job to consent the patients and to administer the blinded treatment. And it was crucial that neither the patient 
nor the doctor knew which arm of the trial the patients were in. The finding that the combination of aspirin and streptokinase significantly reduced deaths without a significant increase in hemorrhage was big news and very helpful and very quickly changed practice. I joined the BMJ uh, initially for a year only, but that's, uh, well, that's another story. Uh, and at the BMJ, I learned how research gets published, the process of peer review, uh, and the new science, new to me at least, of journalology, the study of journals and, and the study of peer review. And I discovered that contrary to my experience with ISIS II, research did not always get taken up, and that there was a gap between research and practice, and that we needed to find ways to bridge this gap. It was this that I decided to study when I went to Harvard on a one-year Harkness Fellowship. It was called GRIP, Getting Research into Practice, and it was considered to be the thing that everyone should be trying to do. There I was introduced to the work of Tom Chalmers and colleagues who had published this very important paper in 1992 in the New England Journal showing the effect of cumulative meta-analysis. So down the... Um, left-hand side is the, are the individual trials of uh, streptokinase in myocardial infarction. And on the right-hand side is the effect, if you were to do those, um, cumulatively meta-analyze those trials, each one being added to the next one. And you can see that really by about the third of those trials, we're talking now in 1969, uh, you have already got the confidence limits um, to the, to the side that favours treatment. And as you go down and down and down, all that's really happening is greater certainty around that result. I hope that is clear. I haven't got a pointer. I found this an extraordinary piece of work. I'm, I'm not the only one. Many people were, were, were amazed by this and realised that actually if we were able to do this prospectively, adding one trial onto the next, how much more quickly would we know uh, what the outcome should be? Uh, Tom Chalmers himself influenced the thinking of another Chalmers, no relation, but Ian Chalmers, who went on to found the Cochrane Collaboration. And when I was in my Harkness Fellowship, I went to the second meeting of the Cochrane Colloquium in 1994. Um, and it, I, I absorbed the feeling then that what, what everyone was trying to do was, was think about the way, if only we could, bring together the knowledge from all of our research so far, how much more quickly would we get to the truth? Back in England, the big discussion was about overwhelm. Doctors, um, in, as in any country, completely overwhelmed with the amount of information that they were having to absorb. Um, and we talked a lot at the BMJ of trying to invent what we called the thing. The thing was going to be the thing that would help doctors make sense of all of this and help them keep up to date with this mountain of information that they were dealing with. One answer um, was a, a tool of some sort, and we realised it would have to be something that had a lot of usefulness, and we dis discussed usefulness being relevance times validity of the information divided by the work it took to access it. And I was involved in developing a product called Clinical Evidence, which was intended to be such a thing. It, it, it had its limitations, but it was an attempt to do that. One of the important things about clinical evidence, in my view, was that we talked not only about the evidence for where we knew what would work, but also the, where, where we didn't know. So we looked at as much of what we did know as, much, as what, what we didn't know. So we tried to also understand the dark side of the moon as a, as a, a concept. So clinical evidence was a compendium of summaries of the best available evidence on common clinical interventions, weighing up the benefits and harms. These were the early days in the early 1990s in which the idea of evidence-based medicine, which we now take so much for granted, was beginning to move from enthusiasts into the mainstream. And you will no doubt uh, immediately think of David Sackett, who really was the person who, with others who drove this movement. Uh, David Sackett published this important editorial in, in the BMJ in 1996, which was an attempt to explain to people who had criticized evidence-based medicine, calling it cookbook medicine, um, to try to explain to them what it really was. He said, the criticisms have already ranged from evidence-based medicine being old hat to it being a dangerous innovation perpetrated by the arrogant to serve cost cutters and suppress clinical freedom. There was a real sense that it was actually forcing people to, 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 to follow protocols and, and lose all their autonomy. 
But what he said, importantly, was that evidence-made medicine is the conscientious, explicit and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. The practice of evidence-based medicine means integrating individual clinical expertise with the best available external clinical evidence from systematic research. Now, this is a hugely important idea, and it's very hard to argue with. But what of the quality of the raw material? How good is the evidence? And it's fair to say that the signs in, at that time were not already not looking good. Uh, Doug Altman wrote this very important uh, research uh, editorial that has been voted the most important thing the BMJ published for the last 20 years. The scandal of poor medical research. We need less research, better research, and research done for the right reasons. It's an editorial worth reading again. Uh, it talks about the, 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 the completely unacceptable state of affairs when people use the wrong techniques, the right techniques wrongly, misinterpret their results, report their results selectively, cite the literature selectively, and draw unjustified conclusions. He said, we should be as appalled. This is surely a scandal. Another person saying the same thing now, 10 years later in 2005, is John Ioannides. And here is an article in PLOS Medicine in which he says, it can be proven that most claimed research findings are false, which is a very frightening prospect. Now, the problems um, that the evidence base faces, are, is it's a long list and it's a growing list. And I'm just going to quickly, oh, sorry, let me just say, um, first of all, before I say that, importantly to reiterate, the principles of evidence-based medicine, as laid out by David Sackett and colleagues in, 1990, uh, in the 1990s, are entirely sound. Evidence-based practice requires these three things, best research evidence, clinical expertise, and the patient's values and preferences. But the list of problems is long and growing. So here is a list. It's not a complete list, but it's one that um, may serve for the moment. We ask the wrong questions. We don't involve patients in design or interpretation. We use the wrong techniques or the wrong analyses. We misinterpret results. We manipulate to get the desired answer. We overstate the conclusions. We have selective reporting of benefits and harms. We tend to overstate the benefits, understate the harms. Peer review is flawed. We do not engage, as authors do not engage with post-publication peer review, critique of their papers. Data is hidden. We have financial and academic vested interests driving the research agenda, uh, capturing academia, in control of the design and analysis and interpretation of research, and holding and hiding the data. We have positive publication bias. We heard a lot about that this morning. We have fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism, which is the official uh, definition of fraud. We have regulatory failure for drugs and devices um, on, in many areas. And, and not written there, but I would add real problems with the production of guidelines. That's, that's the subject of a whole other thing. All of the above cause research waste and clinical harm. And we heard this morning about the very important series in The Lancet on waste, uh, which came to the view that 85% of research effort is wasted, uh, with an estimated um, cost of more than $100 billion a year. So that, that should give us a great deal of pause. These are all problems of research integrity and of corruption of the information that should guide practice and policy, and together they drive escalating healthcare costs. Uh, importantly, these problems are not going away. Indeed, they have worsened as the rate of medical knowledge has accelerated, as commercial influence has grown, and academic pressures have increased. Someone said to me yesterday, the generation of evidence has become a business. So for the next bit of my talk, I just wanted to use some examples to try to illustrate this, because it's all rather dry otherwise. And um, first of all, publication bias. We know that positive studies are more likely to be published, published faster, published in higher impact factor journals, cited. And also, they can be published more than once, which is a very helpful way to make your results look better. So this was a study done back in 1997. It's a very old study, you might say, but it illustrates the point very well. Uh, these people, Tremer et al., looked at the effectiveness of a danzatron, which is a, an anti-emetic uh, drug. And um, they found uh, a number of studies. Um, they found what they thought were um, 86 studies or so. When they actually looked at these studies, they found that many had been duplicated. And in fact, the number of patients, which had looked like about 12,000, was really only about 8,000 patients. Um, and if you look at these results, what you find is that um, the bottom number, the 25, uh, is 25 studies that they looked at came to a very certain result that this drug is effective. So that's a, a low number needed to treat of about two, just, but, sorry, about four. 
So that looks like a very nice result. Um, lots of certainty, a very positive result. Going up the um, diagram, you will see that that result becomes less positive, less certain. Um, and um, when you look at that very top number, the original trials that were not duplicated, you have a number needed to treat much more like 10. So you need to treat many more patients to get a result. And the confidence limits around that are much wider, so it's a much less certain result. So what, what they did was they deduplicated um, and they found that many of these studies had been published more than once uh, with different authorship to hide that effect. So this is really what we would now call fraud. In those days, it was um, just one of those things, I think. But this study, I think, really gave a good illustration. I'll try to describe this quickly. This is a, another very interesting, much more recent study, 2010, which shows that this is, no, this is still a problem. So this uh, drug, Reboxetine, is, a, is an antidepressant. And in Germany, uh, the authors there were trying to... Um, the, the, the regulator there was trying to decide whether to provide this drug um, on insurance uh, for the German people. And they asked the manufacturer, Pfizer, to give them all the data. And Pfizer was refusing, so they said, well, if you don't give us your data, we won't make your drug available. So um, eventually the data were given, and these authors found that 75% of the data had never been published at all. Uh, and when you uh, combined the, the data so that you got the published data, the um, information changed from a drug that was considered effective and safe to one that was actually ineffective and harmful. So let me try and describe without a pointer that very top set of um, three, three buttons there on the, on the plot. Uh, those are the data relating to remission. And the very top uh, button is for the published data. And what that shows is that the Roboxetine is better than the, than the control. But if you look at the next button down, that's for the unpublished data, and the, the button moves over. If you look at the total, that, di that, that diamond-shaped one, it really shows there's no effect in, on remission at all. The second three buttons do the same for response. Again, it looks positive, but when you put the unpublished data in, it becomes neutral. And then if you look at the, at the um, very bottom three buttons, it's the reverse effect. So you've got withdrawal due to side effects. And when you have the published data, um, those, uh, it looks like the control and the active treatment are the same. When you put in the unpublished data, uh, you can see that there are more side effects with the active treatment. So this is a, a scandal, you could say. This is hidden data, and the effect is that patients are being misled and harmed. Now, um, there are many ways to get the results you want, and this is an article that my predecessor, Richard Smith, wrote just after he left the BMJ. So when you leave a journal, you're suddenly free to really speak your mind, and this was Richard speaking his mind. Um, and uh, this long list of things you can do to get the, get the results you want. You can conduct a trial of your drug against a treatment known to be inferior. You can trial your drugs against too low a dose of a competitor drug. You can conduct a trial of your drug against too high a dose of a competitor drug to make your drug seem less toxic. You can conduct trials that are too small to show differences from competitor drugs. You can use multiple endpoints in the trial and select for publication only those that give favourable results. That's a very commonly um, attractive option here. Uh, you can do multiple multi-centre trials and select for publication only those results from the centres that are favourable. You can conduct subgroup analyses and select from publication only those that are favourable. And you can present the results that are most likely to impress, for example, reduction in relative rather than absolute risk. So the way you present the results can change. There are other things not on this list. You can use surrogate endpoints rather than clinical endpoints. Uh, you can use small differences in large trials to suggest a clinically significant difference when, in fact, it's not clinically significant. Or there's an even quicker thing you can do, which is just to make up the results completely. And here are two people who seem to have done that, uh, Andrew Wakefield and Don Polderman. Polderman I bring as an example, as he's um, from Erasmus University, so he's closer to home. Um, both of them have lost their jobs, but that does not mean that harm has not been done. Uh, we heard earlier about the case of MMR. I'll only mention it very briefly. The important thing about this article in, in the BMJ by Brian Deere, an investigative journalist, was that it showed that the MMR study published in The Lancet in 1998 was not just poorly done, but it was fraudulent. Uh, Andrew Wakefield was struck off the register in the UK, so he's no longer a doctor, uh, and the paper was retracted from The Lancet. But Andrew Wakefield is back, and I don't know if you've seen uh, pictures of him standing next to Donald Trump, and the whole of the vaccine scare 
anti-vaccine movement is in high um, uh, optimism and, and um, confidence in the US now. Uh, what we have now is not only the direct impact of this on vaccine rates, but also we now have just announced, um, I understand, an epidemic of mumps in Texas. Texas has the lowest rate of uh, vaccination in the America. It's where Andrew Wakefield lives, and so that may be no surprise. Not only the direct effect on people's health, but the indirect effect that as a result of this um, we can't really anymore have a sensible conversation about the safety of vaccines. It's very, very hard for researchers to raise concerns about safety of vaccines as a whole because of um, the, the toxic nature of this conversation. As for Don Polderman, um, I'll explain this, uh, uh, vision, this image in a minute. As he was at Erasmus University, he had done some very influential research about perioperative beta blockade uh, for people at risk of, of um, myocardial infarction. Um, he's on the guidelines panel of the European Society, relevant producing these guidelines. But in 2011, he was sacked for research, misconduct, ethical breaches, and fabrication of data. Uh, what was a problem, though, was that even um, with that knowledge, the evidence base was quite slow to change. And this is a, an article published in the BMJ which illustrates that point. Um, uh, again, it might be, I'll just try to explain, but this is another of those plots showing the, on one side, favouring the beta blocker, perioperative beta blockade, and on the other side, favouring the controls. And this is the slide that shows when you remove Polderman's research, if you take away the decreased trials, can you see it says there, without the decreased trials, these data show that the, what was a favourable result now becomes a, a negative, unfavourable result. And, and what these authors were saying was, but why have the guidelines not changed? It takes a while for the evidence base to change. Uh, in addition to which, there's a debate about two papers published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which that journal has refused to retract, uh, despite the fact that um, the researchers who were named by Polderman as being on the safety committee for the trials um, have denied any knowledge that they were on that safety committee. Um, and also, despite the fact that there were unexplained discrepancies between the protocol and the published papers. So um, there, there's a real concern that these papers are still in the literature and the New England Journal has decided not to publish them, uh, not to retract them. So is research fraud on the rise? Well, if you look at these data, it might suggest that, they, that it is. These are data from um, all of the studies retracted by PubMed up until 2012. Uh, about um, a fifth of them were retracted because of error, uh, two thirds of them by, uh, because of misconduct. And the percentage of scientific articles retracted because of fraud has increased tenfold since 1975. Now, it, these are data which may just suggest that we're becoming more aware of fraud and that we're more willing to act on it. So journals are more willing to retract the, the fraudulent information. Um, so it's very hard to interpret. Uh, I, I, we, 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 there, there's no way, really, it's very hard to know how much fraud goes on. The two I mentioned are, are two headline uh, uh, types of um, a case, and it's fair to say that that level of fraud is probably quite rare. Other questionable practices are much more pervasive, so misreporting of data, underreporting, non-reporting across the literature, and these two are forms of scientific misconduct. These, these, these questionable practices about failure to pr properly report. And this is a, uh, an overview that was published in 2010, um, which identified reporting bias, that's misreporting, underreporting, non-reporting of data, in 40 indications comprising about 50 different pharmacological, surgical, diagnostic, and preventive interventions. Many cases involved the withholding of study data by manufacturers and regulatory agencies, or the active attempt by manufacturers to suppress publication. Uh, and the report, the effects of the reporting bias included the overestimation of efficacy and the underestimation of harm. So again, we get this um, terrific drive towards medical excess, positive views, um, the phrase optimism bias, people thinking that things are better than they are, the new drug is better than the old drug, and any drug is better than no drug. So this, this is a, a, real, a real concern. Now, is there good evidence that these questionable science practices drive over, over optimistic assessment? Um, and I think we can say there is. This is a study which looked at um, stem cell trials and their, the effect of stem cells on ejection fraction of the heart. Um, and what these authors did was they looked at the number of discrepancies per trial and, and to see whether there was an association between the, the more problematic trials and the size of the effect that was reported 
And you can see from this, uh, this, these data that as the discrepancies increase, so the, 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 the most discrepant trials have more than 30 discrepancies at the far end there. And you can see that those trials had a much higher rate, a much, much more positive result, a much higher um, effect size on improvement on the ejection fraction. So as the trials become less good, the um, positive uh, uh, conclusions become stronger. So we have concerns that flawed evidence is driving too much medicine. And Iona Heath, who's been a very prominent uh, speaker on this, who you will know, she's a, a general practitioner, very, very brilliant writer, um, said she called this a toxic combination of vested interest and good intentions. Uh, in the BMJ, we have our Too Much Medicine campaign, uh, and a lot of this is about medicalization of um, people who otherwise would be considered normal by expanding definitions of disease, and also disease mongering, that's creating new diseases um, to, to, to label people with. And uh, a phrase that perhaps summarizes this is the idea of a pill for every ill. And then if you talk about disease mongering, you have an ill for every pill. And um, in order to try to raise a, a slight uh, humorous view on this, we published um, this news item. Uh, it's very importantly dated April the 1st, 2006, so we think people would understand what it was about. Um, it mentions the discovery of a new disease called motivational deficiency disorder, uh, considered to affect one in five Australians, uh, and so, so severe that some of them had lost the motivation to breathe. Uh, and luckily, a new drug had been developed called Indolabant, which was extremely successful to the extent that some people who had been confined to their sofas had become investment bankers in Sydney. So uh, we felt, thought this was pretty clearly a good joke. Uh, some poor New Zealand journalist picked it up and did a big story on it, thinking it was serious and was very cross with us. Uh, but we did get some very good rapid responses, one of which said, we discovered this condition five years ago and couldn't be bothered to write it up. More seriously, we have been doing um, articles which have tried to demonstrate the problem of over-diagnosis and over-treatment, and this is just one of them, uh, looking at the evidence to see um, how, how this is happening. And this is about mild hypertension in people at low risk. And the idea is that we want to treat hypertension, but at what point should we, should we treat mild and mild and milder and milder hypertension? How many people do we want to bring into this um, treatment envelope? Um, and um, this was really reporting the fact that we are pushing the criteria more and more towards a normal blood pressure. And the rationale for this change is that patients with even mildly raised blood pressure may have increased cardiovascular risk. But what we wanted to show was there is a leap of faith here. And the leap of faith is that lowering the threshold of blood pressure will lead to increased diagnosis and treatment, which will decrease mortality. Now, that is something that has not been shown. There's no evidence that that is the case. So we're treating people without really knowing if they're going to get benefit. Then we talk about the impact of this on the prevalence, the, di the evidence of overdiagnosis, the harm of this, which is people taking drugs that may not help them, um, and the limitations and the conclusions. So for all of these um, a number of conditions, we've, we've really tried to dissect out what is going on and how, how, how is that working. So... We mentioned um, Tamiflu, uh, Tamiflu, and the reason I just want to quickly whiz through this story is because it is iconic. I think it's not an isolated case of hidden data, but it is one that has really made, certainly made me, uh, it's radicalised me. Talk about ISIS too. I feel radicalised by the story of Tamiflu. I think we all should. So the story was that the government was decide, trying to decide whether to buy Tamiflu to provide it liberally um, to uh, protect people from getting complications of uh, the new bird flu that was coming through. Uh, and the Cochrane Collaboration had published an article in the Lancet which had shown the drug to be tr uh, effective, and they thought they would just update that. But they got a message from a, a Japanese pediatrician who said to them, did you know that the, the 10 trials you've used for your Cochrane Review are all funded by Roche. Only two of them have been published in full. Um, and um, the Cochrane people thought this was not good enough, so they decided they would try to get the data. They wrote to the authors of the studies and were told that they didn't have the data. They were told to go to the company. They wrote to the company, Roche. Roche said, we can't give it to you. At which point they came to the BMJ, and the whole story, from my point of view, unfolded. Uh, it took us five years to get the data. In the meantime, we, we tried to describe what was going on, the problems of where these data were. We published this very important study from Peter Doshi, a, 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 a narrative uh, article, in which he had this table, which shows uh, those who think that Tamiflu works against complications, the four, 
and those who say it doesn't against. And you'll see at the top that Roche is on both of those lists. And that's because in America, where the against, um, the against is in America, the FDA has found that it doesn't work. And so Roche in the America can't use the drug. They can't say the drug works. But in Europe, where the EMA says it does work, they can say that it does. And if you click on the website, you'll see these words. This website is intended for US audiences only. Now, I mean, that's ridiculous. It just makes you want to laugh or cry or both. Uh, we, we campaigned. We said that there's a legit legitimate scientific concern that data used to support important public health policy decisions are held only by a commercial company and have not been subject to independent external scrutiny. We wrote open letters uh, to, in this case, the someone who's on the board of Roche, who is one of Oxford's or Britain's most senior clinicians, asking him why he, why he felt able to continue on the board with Roche behaving in this way. And we published all of the correspondence between the Cochrane Collaboration and all of the different bodies they were trying to get this data from. It took, us, took them, really, and us with helping along five years. Eventually, uh, they did get the data. Uh, and they found that there were 74 trials that the European Medicines Agency, these were all funded by Roche, had, um, had incomplete information on only nine of them, I think, and that the N National Institute of Clinical Excellence in Britain had, had information on only four of those trials. All of the trials were against placebo. None had been against the common other treatments for influenza. The Cochrane Group concluded from this that Tamiflu did not contribute usefully um, and was not worth buying in large amounts. What did the British government do? It, we'd already spent £500 million pounds on it. Uh, we bought another £50 million pounds worth. Very sensible. So, as I say, iconic, radicalising, it showed the deep flaws in the system of drug regulation and evaluation. And it led us at the BMJ to think, what, what can we do? And what we decided to do was we have now asked authors, if they want to have their clinical trials evaluated by the BMJ, they must agree that they will um, share their data if asked but, but by other people, that they will make their data available. Um, and that's the current process. Uh, in addition, um, sorry, I'll leap over that, we, we, we published um, a series of uh, special issues looking at the different uh, problems of trial data. Um, and um, we helped, uh, Ben Goldacre wrote his very imp important book, Bad Pharma, uh, and we, uh, with Ben Goldacre and others um, in Oxford, have founded All Trials, which is an attempt to get all trials registered and all results reported. And this is proving a very important initiative, and, and great credit must go to Ben for his work. Importantly, I've focused on the science um, in industry. It's very important to say it's not just an industry problem, this hidden data. Um, and this is a case of a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, in this case, uh, this was a study looking at hydroxyethyl starch for fluid resuscitation in intensive care. Uh, it was funded um, by the manufacturer. And in this case, the manufacturer did all the right things, we would say. They, handed, they, they, they said they didn't, wouldn't look at the data, they wouldn't have anything to do with it. Um, when the study was published, it found that um, the starch wasn't effective and was even a bit dangerous. The manufacturer obviously thought, oh dear, you know, we'd like to have a look at the data to see that we agree with this. The authors have refused. The authors have said, we cannot share these data with the drug company. We're too frightened what they will do with it. Now, um, we've taken the view that that's not OK, that it can't work one way and not the other. It's very hard, but we've, we, we believe um, that it's not OK. That, um, this idea of data that's too important to share, I think in clinical trials, that, that's a very hard case to make. Um, and um, again, Peter Doshi wrote this very important article just drawing that point. Data sharing is happening, it's very slow to progress, um, and the main emphasis is on new hypotheses rather than checking people's published work. And I, I think we're, certainly the BMJ, really interested in data sharing as a way of scrutinising what, what has been done. And um, this restoring invisible and abandoned trials is another initiative which uh, tries to do that. And as an example, uh, this very uh, renowned, um, in a bad way, trial, uh, study 329 of riboxetine, uh, oh, sorry, paroxetine in adolescents with uh, depression. It's a GSK-funded trial. It's been absolutely um, heavily criticised. It's been the subject of legal action. And so the data are available through the legal, legal uh, dispute. And these authors uh, have got hold of the data, and they have redone the analysis. 
And um, importantly, what they find, if you look at these three blocks of, of um, information, the very bottom one says Keller. That's the original study published. And these are the adverse effects. These are suicidal and self-injurious events in these young children, young people with depression taking paroxetine. And in the Keller version that's published and still there, hasn't been retracted, you can see the number of adverse events on paroxetine versus imipramine versus placebo. And um, they, they viewed that was not problematic. Um, and also they tended to define them as headache or not, not very major. When reanalyzed independently, um, these adverse events were found to be much more serious in terms of suicidal ideation, and there were more of them. If you look at the top, that's the paper that we published, the riot paper. So uh, that, that's an example of how we can go back and, and look at data ahead again. Okay, I'm just going to move now briefly to... Oh, sorry, this is the final thing, that, 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 that it's a collective failure, and, and there has been no correction, no retraction, no apology, no comment um, from any of the bodies involved, the journal the institute who had employed the authors, um, the drug company. Uh, it, it's, it's a silence from all of them. Um, I'm just going to move on to patient partnership, which is a, a thing very, very close to our heart at the BMJ. Tessa Richards there has led this, and it's been an amazingly important initiative. Um, we have a um, patient panel advising us. We have a patients peer reviewing our research. We have patients co-authoring co co our editorials and our education articles. And we have patient involvement statements in our um, education and research articles saying how were patients involved in this work. And to my great delight, um, we were given um, this wonderful award or, or, or tick um, by uh, people at, um, at Radboud, uh, and we're very proud of that as a, as a symbol of what we're trying to do. Just as an example of the patients included box, I just picked this at random, this study. It's not to, to criticise the authors, um, but sometimes the patients included box says this. No patients were involved in setting the research question or the outcome measures, nor were they involved in developing plans for implementation of the study. No patients were asked to advise on interpretation or writing up the results. There are no plans to disseminate the results of the research to study participants or the relevant patient community. Now, I get emails from readers saying, why are you publishing this research? Well, this is normal. This is, this is the normal state of affairs. And we publish these statements to try to show people that it's just not acceptable that that, that should be the case. We've done a study, and we've looked at the number of our research articles where there is something positive in this box, and I'm afraid it's only 7%. Uh, and normally, that positive thing is just the last thing, that they have plans to disseminate. There's very little positive in the design or dissemination. So I'm going to talk a bit about the effects of financial conflict of interest as, as another problem that we face. Um, these are three quite old now studies looking at the effects of financial conflicts of interest on the outcomes of the studies. So the first one found that studies funded by drug companies were four times more likely to have results favourable to the sponsor than studies funded by others. The second found that although financial ties were not associated with favourable results, they were associated with favourable conclusions. This is the spin that people can put on their studies. And then the third one shows that authors who took favourable view of this particular drug were more likely to have links with manufacturers. When I show these data, people often say, oh, well, that's old, it's all fine, we've sorted that out, no more problem. But uh, just this year, we published this study, uh, which took a random sample of randomised trials of drug, drug efficacy and looked for the association between the principal investigator's financial ties and the trial outcome. And um, it found an association, uh, which was that um, if, if you are a principal investigator with industry ties, the association was um, that you were more likely to find a positive result in that study. Um, and that was independent of whether the trial was funded by the industry. For me, almost one of the most interesting things about this study is that two-thirds of the trials were funded by industry. And part of the uh, thing I will be developing as, as I come to a close is about how important it is that we need many more in, independent studies, especially of drugs and devices. Uh, just before I was coming to speak, I wanted to ask some colleagues out there by email. I just sent an email saying, what proportion of drug studies are funded by industry? And the answer is it, it, it's very hard to tell. Uh, in fact, this is probably an overestimate. Maybe half to, to two-thirds is what people are saying. Um, but interestingly, Lisa Barrow, who's done a lot of the good work on this, 
um, just sent me an email saying that of all the drug of all the trials submitted to the FDA for new drug approval um, that she was looking at, all of them were industry funded. And she says all were industry funded. Doesn't that tell us something? All that she says all the trials the regulator was seeing were industry funded. She just you know it's just bad bad news we would say. Um, and my question is, should we be calling on regulators to insist that at least one of the trials is independent of the manufacturer. In the email discussion I've just had, people are saying that's unrealistic, it's never going to happen, who would fund them, how would it work? It would slow down regulation um, of drugs. But in the mean, uh, and, and, and instead of that, what people want is faster, faster, faster approval of drugs. Um, and I think that's what Trump's America will deliver. And I think we have to be very, very wary of that. Um, we've just published this editorial which looks at um, is there a wider role for regulatory scientists? The scientists at the FDA do this amazing job of, of scrutinizing, painfully scrutinizing the, da the data they're given. They often find things, but they just put them in the, in the FDA documents. They don't put them up into the medical literature. So they don't, they're not seen, the, these, these problems. And going back to study 329 of paroxetine, if you look in the FDA documents, I haven't done this, but others have, there is a statement by the FDA uh, scrutinizer saying this was a failed trial. This trial did not show that the drug was effective. But that information didn't make it out into the literature. It didn't make it out into clinical practice. It did, they didn't write to the journal to say, you need to know that I've done this. It just sat in doc documents in the FDA vaults. And, and this, egg, this, um, this editorial argues for them to be given permission or to give themselves permission to be more, um, to be more active in, in this. Has the hunt for conflict of interest gone too far? Uh, this argued, this, this person argued no, and I would agree that it's not gone far enough. Uh, what is it about conflicts of interest that bother us? Is it having them at all, or is it failing to declare them? Uh, there is a phrase that we use in the BMJ that disclosure is almost a panacea. If you tell someone that you murdered your husband, maybe that's okay. Um, personally, I don't think it is. Um, so how do we act when we, when we get a disclosure? We can either say that disclosure is enough, after that anything goes, caveat emptor. We can say that disclosure should be followed by a judgment call about the degree of potential conflict. Is this person sufficiently unconflicted to do the job that we want them to do? Or we can say that disclosure of a conflict of interest is a bar to taking part. So for example, in a membership of a panel, authorship of an editorial, involvement in a piece of research. And this Institute of Medicine report is now again quite old, but I thought it was a very, very important piece of work. Uh, and they have a, an interesting statement within it which says, researchers should not conduct research if they have a financial interest in the outcome. I think that's an incredibly important statement. And, and I think it, it gets back to that thing about how independent can we make research? How can, how can we make it independent? Is it possible to make in research independent of financial conflict? Um, and, and one of the ideas is, can we move beyond transparency to reward those um, who keep themselves free of conflict? So instead of, um, which has been the tradition, if you, if you take a, uh, money, you get flown around the world, and you do speak on platforms, and you, all of that is, 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 is how things largely are at the moment. Can we reverse that and say those people who don't take the money are the people we would like to support. So um, priority for public funding, priority for editorships and membership of guideline panels. Uh, should the drug industry use key opinion leaders um, and should journals and other people allow that to happen? Um, we have taken the view that we do not want key opinion leaders writing our education articles in the BMJ. And we've developed a new policy, this was back in 2014, of zero tolerance on education articles with relevant financial links to industry. Very, very difficult to do. We commission an article. We have to go very deeply into the author's life and um, you know, find out or ask them to fill in a very complicated form. And they have to be willing to do that. Um, and then we have to say, sometimes quite hard, to say, I'm so sorry, we can't um, invite you to write this article. It's getting easier, whether it's getting easier because we're getting better at it or because authors are getting used to it or because this culture outside is changing, I don't know. But our purpose in doing this is to change the culture. We're doing this not just to make sure that people can trust what we publish. We want to send a message. We want to say, these are the people we, we want to hear from. Uh, other journals have said, you'll never get the right, you'll never get enough expertise. It, you know, you, you'll be publishing bad education. 
My view is that bad education is education that is tainted by conflicts of interest. We are in a bit of a fight. I don't want, it's not a personal fight, but the New England Journal has taken a very different view. And they published a series of articles, um, uh, when was this, uh, back in 2015, uh, where they, they were really saying conflict of interest is not such a problem. People should work closely with industry. We shouldn't be so worried. Um, we published in, in response to that um, this piece by three former editors of the New England Journal of Medicine. And I, I think it's, it's, a, it's an important work again. And one of the things um, they say is, um, I'll just read you this bit. The New England Journal has now sought to reinterpret and downplay the importance of conflicts of interest in medicine by publishing articles that show little understanding of the meaning of the term. The concern is not whether physicians and researchers who receive industry money have been bought by drug companies, as Drazen writes, or whether members of guideline panels or advisory committees to the US Food and Drug Administration with ties to industry make recommendations that are motivated by a desire for financial gain, as Rosenbaum writes. The essential issue is that it is impossible for editors and readers to know one way or the other. Now, that, to me, is the crux of the matter. How can we tell? And they go on to say that judges have to recuse themselves. Journalists are not allowed to take payment um, from uh, someone if they're writing a report. So um, that, that, to me, is the crux of the matter. And this very good editorial by Elizabeth Loder, who's on the BMJ, um, says, it is a mistake to combine evidence production and appraisal functions in a single person. Some academics must work closely with industry to develop and commercialise new medical treatments, but they should not also author editorials, reviews or guidelines that appraise them. These are different professional responsibilities and they clash. And I think for me that has been very important. So, yes, Maastricht, we have a problem. We all agree that we need to use evidence to guide clinical and policy decisions, but there is an assumption that evidence is like a commodity and all of the same quality, like water, available on tap whenever we need it. In reality, this is far from the case. There is water and there is contaminated water, and it really matters which one you drink. But it's not always possible to tell what you're drinking. It can be easy to be sucked into behaviours or activities that contaminate the stream of water that other people must drink from. And it can be hard to fight against the current. Journals want to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem, but we have our conflicts of interest too. We have impact factor, which we have to try to maintain. We have commercial revenues we have to maintain. We have our own academic reputations that we want to build. But it's fair to say that good things have happened. We've had reporting guidelines. We've had trial registration. Data sharing is happening a bit better now. We have policies on conflicts of interest, and we have various bodies where journals meet and discuss their problems and try to come to common solutions. Along the way in my editorship, I've realised that as well as being a repository of knowledge, a journal is a set of tools that can be used to intervene. Um, research, publishing research, publishing education, academic comment, investigative journalism, campaigning, and of course the editorial policies uh, by which uh, we ourselves walk the walk as well as talk the talk. Uh, and as well as being a product of the culture of science and medicine, a journal can help to change the culture. Uh, and I, I think it's fair to say that we do our best to push even further at the BMJ to improve the integrity of the evidence base. We have open access of research, we have open peer review, we have pre-publication history published with our uh, published articles. We also have a robust post-publication review process in our rapid responses. Uh, we have mandatory data sharing for clinical trials. We encourage publication of entire data sets. We have patient co-creation of research and educational material. We have a zero tolerance for relevant financial conflicts in educational material. Uh, we are training and capacity building in research and publication ethics. And we have our investigations and campaigns. And just recently, we have agreed um, to declare annually our income from industry. This has been a, something I've wanted to do for a long time. Um, and it's now uh, my chief executive for the publishing company has agreed that we will do this. And I'm really delighted because I think we'll be the first journal to do this and I'd like to see other journals follow. The question is, should we take, or should all journals take a, a more radical approach? Should we stop publishing research that's funded by industry? Uh, I mean here phase three research. Um, uh, I think that, that's the issue that strikes me as important. Um, I don't think that the manufacturers should be involved in evaluating the clinical effectiveness of their products um, in this way, in phase three and phase four trials. 
Should we stop publishing research at all? Is research better published in open access databases? I think this is where we are heading. We, 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 should, we should accept the fact that's where things are heading. And should we promote clinical research that's led by patients, not just where patients are involved, but where they actually lead? This got me, and I'm just coming to the close now, I hope, um, about what, it do, what does good research look like? Um, because I think we need to be um, optimistic. There is good research out there. And these were the seven criteria that I came up with when I was writing this talk. You may not agree with them, but these were the things I, I felt were important. It must answer an important question based on perhaps a survey of the user's needs and prior systematic review. Not a question that academics want answering or the industry wants answering, but a question that patients and doctors want answered. It should involve patients from the outset and throughout. It should be independent of financial vested interests. It should be well designed and implemented, fully and transparently reported, including registration and publication of a protocol before research begins, published open access with data shared, and criticism responded to and corrections made if necessary. So, I am, um, uh, and, and in, in asking people about these seven criteria, I was given others, and these are, does it serve equity and social justice? Does it use resources efficiently? Does it have a low carbon footprint? Um, um, and one person said this would preclude pre presenting the results at international conferences, so you wouldn't be able to travel to present your results. Um, and does it do a full reporting of cost effectiveness or affordability? Uh, one important thing for me is that independence alone I don't think is enough. Um, some people say you can have independence or transparency. I think, I think we need both. So I asked for some examples of good research, and I will just briefly present three of them that came. There are many more, but these were just three. Um, oh, sorry, that was what I just said. Um, these are the possible, if you're really extra good, you might do these five things as well. Um, so this is a study published in PLOS Medicine. The authors may not mind me saying that they sent it to the BMJ and we rejected it. I think we were wrong to reject it. It's one of those examples where we make mistakes too. So it's a good, it's, I think it's an excellent study, and it's looking at whether silk clothing improves life for children with eczema. Um, and um, the answer is um, that they don't. That the money being spent on silk clothing, um, a large amount of money, uh, two million annually on silk clothing in the NHS for children. And um, the silk clothing manufacturers donated the silk clothing for this study. And we're very sad, I think, that the result was negative. Uh, this is, was independently funded, um, and it's been fully reported, um, open access in PLOS Medicine. Interestingly, the impact is being felt in Holland. I, I learned that the Dutch Eczema Association are using these results to inform patients and are currently debating whether to continue with a planned trial that they had been going to do on, on this question. So, so this is, is a very good study, ticks all the boxes for me. Um, this one is uh, a study published in the BMJ, which uh, is a real-world look at whether warfarin uh, protects against um, uh, stroke. And it, it ticks all the same boxes. And again, it finds that it, 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 it does work outside clinical trials. So uh, a good study. And then I asked Ono to suggest a good study. And um, this is the one that he suggested, which I gather has just received an award. So congratulations to the authors. I don't need to go into a great deal of detail. But I think it's fair to say that this um, was a, a study which designed and evaluated a tool to see um, whether the tool would uh, improve the quality of life for people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and all of those boxes that, uh, that I um, mentioned were ticked, patient involvement, independent uh, funding, uh, really good open access publication, uh, correcting and responding to criticism uh, online. Um, so congratulations to that. So it seems to me that we have a problem. I, I don't need to reiterate it. Um, those three um, reports that I've just mentioned show that there is good clean water in the system. The question is, what do we need to do to make this the norm rather than the exception, as it may seem to be? And this quote from Socrates um, really talks about the fact that we shouldn't tw tweak the edges. We need to do something radical to change. The secret of change is to focus all your energy not in fighting the old, but on building the new. So if we accept that the current system that generates the evidence is not fit for purpose, then we need to build a new system that reduces waste in research and improves the effectiveness and safety of healthcare. Indeed, this is our moral and ethical duty, I would argue, and our shared responsibility. 
I'm very glad that I'm working now with the Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine in Oxford, the BMJ, and they are working together with many others. And this is not intended as an exclusive project. We want this to be something that people will join in with. Um, and it is a manifesto and a call for involvement to create a better system to generate evidence that will um, improve uh, the evidence base. It's a, a work in progress. These are the nine things that we want this manifesto to do. Um, it, it, this is really scoping out the terrain. Under each of these, if you go to the website, um, you will find descriptions of what we hope and think need to be done. Um, so I'm not going to go into them in great detail, but we need to empower, uh, to expand the role of patients and others in the design and implementation of research. We need to increase the systematic use of existing evidence. We want to make research evidence relevant, replicable and accessible to end users. We want to reduce these other questionable research practices, bias and conflicts of interest. We want to ensure that drug and device regulation and evaluation is robust, transparent and independent. Produce better usable clinical guidelines, including tools for shared decision making. Support innovation, quality improvement and safety through better use of real world data. Educate professionals, policymakers, and the public in evidence-based healthcare so they can make informed decisions and encourage the next generation of leaders in evidence-based medicine, which is you. So we've spent the past 20 years looking at all of this and we don't want to be look back in 10 years time and be saying the same thing. A great deal of unnecessary cost and harm will be the result. So I'm going to finish by taking you back to my story, my family. This is my father today. He's 89 and doing well. And that's my daughter, she's 15. I don't think she plans to go into medicine. She's more interested in drama and art. But three of my nieces are training to be doctors. So the medical tradition is continuing. My question for us all is, what kind of evidence will we create for them to base their decisions on? Danke well for u undacht. Ich heb gesagt. Thank you so much. You definitely are a professor with a mission, a mission I wholeheartedly support. We need to work on the manifesto, Nana, in the coming periods. Very, no, thank you so much for bringing this. Uh, you say Maastricht, we have a problem. Uh, we have a, a movement in the Netherlands called Science in Transition that is also actually trying to address the issues that you have raised. I'm very much in favor of uh, radical uh, solutions, and I think we need to work on that. And the fact that FHML, the faculty, has uh, installed this chair, I am very proud of that, because that also shows that they are willing to take the responsibility to make the necessary changes. So thank you very much. Also to the faculty, I have to say that. Uh, we are now close. Uh, we are at the end of the uh, ceremony. We will go to the, our reception room where you can uh, congratulate the newly installed professor. Uh, please do that by following the cortege. I wish you all a wonderful weekend and thank you for coming to this inaugural. Thank you.